Shalom Havarim. Hello, friends. Hello. All right. <laughs> Good to be with you here on this special occasion, this special day. Today marks a anniversary of sorts. It marks a reoccurring event. It marks a, a day that we should all remember for years to come. And of course, you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the one-week anniversary of the opening of Long John Silver's in Stanton, Virginia. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <laughs> what, what, what did you think I was talking about? Mother's Day. Oh, okay. Oh, no, I was thinking about the opening of this restaurant in town, which has, for some reason, just taken off like wildfire. Um, Lois's family can't get to their home because the roads are so backed up every day along, what is that, Greenville Avenue. So, folks, if you do want to take your mother's out for a fine fish restaurant, <laughs> fish, fish uh, meal. If you want to take her out for lunch today to Long John Silver's, you should probably have been in line two hours ago. It is that busy. No, of course, we're not talking about the opening of Long John Silver's. Um, we are talking about, say it again, Sarah Dell, it was Mother's Day. Yes, of course, today is a day we set aside to remember our mothers. So if you have not yet called your mother Send her a text or a card. If she is still living, I encourage you to do so today. Um, or if she's here with you, don't take that for granted. Make sure to give her lots of hugs and kisses and take care of her today. Look at that, on demand. <laughs> what else do you want me to ask him to do? I can totally do that. <laughs> right. <laughs> and show her your appreciation by cleaning the floors. But as, as Curtis mentioned, and Tate also mentioned, you know, this, this is kind of a strange day in the church because it is a difficult time for many people. We talk about remembering our mothers, but many people in the congregation, many people in the world no longer have a mother. Perhaps your mother has passed on. Um, it's also a really hard time, and that's for men and women. It's not just a difficult time for, for women. Or it's also a really difficult time for those who desire to be a mother, but that hasn't happened. So I find it really challenging to know how to approach Mother's Day in the church. I've been a part of churches, actually even in this church, where there have been people who didn't come to, to church on Sunday because it was too painful for them to come. Because they're so used to the church service being focused on mothers and they so deeply wanted to be a mother, it hurt them just to come in the doors. That makes me extremely sad. The church should not be a place that wounds people, that hurts people. It should be a place of healing and hope. So I find myself trying to figure this all out, this balancing act. How do we recognize mothers? Because I think it's, in, it's important to have rituals in the church. How do we recognize these mothers without making it all about them? Because think about it like this. I called this a holiday when I spoke with the children earlier. And indeed, in many ways, it is a holiday. But... We often think of two different kinds of holidays. We sometimes refer to them as secular holidays or sacred holidays or holy holidays, church holidays. And which one is Mother's Day? It would be a secular holiday because, well, it's not commanded in the Bible anywhere to have a holiday to remember our mothers. It's not recognized as a holy day in the church tradition. But yet, on the other hand, it is a holy day. It is a day that is set aside to remember our mothers. So what I want to do today is I'm not going to preach a sermon on mothers. You're all <laughs> juiced about that one. <laughs> I'm not going to preach a sermon about mothers. I'm going to talk about this division, this divide between the sacred and the secular. Now I get some excitement in the crowd, right? <laughs> We're going to talk about the division between the sacred and the secular, and I'm going to use Mother's Day as an example. And hopefully then I can give some honor to our mothers in the process. Does that sound good? Yeah. Excellent. All right, I didn't expect applause, but I will take it. <laughs> so we are going to talk about the sacred and secular divide, and what I want to do today is I'm going to blur that division. Because I think we too often in the church 
make that like a very clear division. What is in and what is out of the church? What belongs inside is holy, is sacred. What is outside is secular or even profane. So we're going to look at this division. I'm going to take my eraser. We're going to divide or we're going to erase that division a little bit and blur those lines. But before we get into some of the details, I want to play a little game with you all today. We're going to call it, is it sacred or is it secular? I'm going to name a few holidays and I want you to call out sacred or secular. If it's a part of the church, call it out. If it is a part of the world, call it sacred, okay? Say sacred or secular. Can we do that? Okay, I'm going to pair these holidays together, two of them at a time. The first one should seem easy to you. Are you ready? Easter and Christmas. Sacred. Okay, call it out real strong, like you know what you're talking about, right? I'm going to try it one more time. Easter and Christmas, it is? Sacred. sacred, absolutely. This is the two holiest days of the church year, right? Holy days for us to celebrate the birth of Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny, respectively. Well, that's what we do, isn't it? No? <laughs> there, I'll give you a tip. We're in the church. It's always about Jesus. <laughs> yeah, well, but, I mean, what I'm trying to say is, like, it's not necessarily always that clear, is it? Because the world has kind of taken these holy days, the high holy days, and kind of secularized them a bit. So, yes, this is a holy day, but it's also kind of secular. All right, you did well. That's great. Let's have another pairing. Are you ready? Sacred or secular? The 4th of July and Memorial Day. Secular. secular, absolutely. These are developed within our country. They are national holidays. But I dare you on the 4th of July or on Memorial Day to not stand up for the Star Spangled Banner, to take a knee, and you will feel the wrath of God poured down upon you by certain people. Listen to the language that is used in a Memorial Day service. And they will talk about people giving their lives much the same way as a martyr gives their life for their religion. You will hear people talk about land like the, the, the Arlington Cemetery in D.C., just outside of D.C. They will talk about it being hollowed ground. This is something that sociologist Robert Bella calls the, um, the, the civic religion of a country. All right, you've done well. I know I'm trying, to, I'm trying to confuse you, but I'm going to go with a really easy one. These even have the names of saints in their titles. Tell me, sacred or secular, St. Patrick's Day and St. Valentine's Day. Which is it? Sacred. <laughs> like, what do we do with that? These were days that were named after saints in the church. These are pillars of the faith. And we celebrate it by giving people chocolate and roses and turning our food and drink and even rivers green. America, right? <laughs> the point that I am making, my friends, is these aren't always as clear as we might want them to be. This division between the secular and the sacred, it's not that clear. Traditionally, we have thought of these sorts of things in the terms of binaries. And you've heard that term before, binary. Um, binary means it's either one thing or the other. It's either on or it's off. The, probably the easiest example is a light switch. The light is either on or off. You can't have anything in between. So we tend to think of secular and sacred as binaries. It's either one thing or the other. The other language that I've been using is holy and profane. And we get these words, this division, this binary way of approaching them from a sociologist known as Emile Durkheim. Emile Durkheim was a French sociologist. So if there's anybody here that speaks French, you can call me out if I butcher it. <laughs> Emile Durkheim made this division between what he called the sacred and the profane. And he wrote this in a book about religion. He was a sociologist of religion. This is from his 1912 book. Um, Durkheim was, he lived from 1858 to 1917. Here's an old picture. I, I love the old pictures, by the way. 
or something cool about that. And his like, right shoulder just kind of disappears off into nothing because it's so faded. Anyway, in 1912, he wrote this about religion. Whether simple or complex, all known religious beliefs display a common feature. They presuppose a classification of the real or ideal things that men conceive of into two classes, two opposite genre, that are widely designated by two distinct terms, which the words profane and sacred translate fairly well. The division of the world into two domains, one containing all that is sacred and the other all that is profane, such is the distinctive trait of religious thought. So if you have something, anything, it can be thought of as either one or the other. It is either sacred, that is something of the church, or profane, something outside of the church. Even our jobs, our occupations, in Durkheim's mind, were either sacred or profane. If you wanted a sacred job, you had to work in the church. That's me. Profane, that's the rest of you. <laughs> so what are the sacred jobs in Durkheim's methodology here? It is, it is pastors, priests, and missionaries. What are the profane jobs? Well, teachers, lawyers, doctors, um, school teachers. Did I say teachers? Um, farmers, homemakers, all of these jobs in Durkheim's thought, are profane. There are also actions and duties and things that we do in the church. These are secular, like the singing of hymns. Sorry, it's sacred. The singing of hymns are sacred. The reading of scripture, sacred. The taking of communion, the administration of baptism, these are sacred rites of the church. Everything else that you do is profane. The doing of your taxes, paying your bills, some of you would say, yeah, that's profane. <laughs> Paving roads, working in the garden, working your job are all profane in Durkheim's view. Now, I need to back up a little bit because Durkheim was French and he wrote in French. And it doesn't quite have the same feel in the language of France, of French. <laughs> because the word that he translates, that we translate as profane is profane but it means something very different in French. In French, the word profane simply means laity. So if you were to look at the word layperson or layman or laywoman, if you put that into Google Translate right now, laity, the word that comes up is profane. And it's, it's, you have to Frenchify it a bit. Can you do that for me, Lois? Profane, I don't know, that's, that's Italian. <laughs> profane or profane in the Italian. It's simply a French word. Now, in my mind, profane means something extreme. If somebody has a bit of a potty mouth, they use bad words a lot. What would we call that? That is profanity. In our language, in the English language, profane is extremely opposite of the church. So when I say that you all have profane jobs, I don't mean that in our English understanding. I mean that in more of the French understanding. So this makes me wonder just what exactly all of these words really mean. I've used four different words. The words like holy and secular and sacred and profane. Well, when you think of the word holy, what comes to your mind? Yell it out. What words? Holy God. Holy. I, I expected more. <laughs> holy cow. And you know what you get from a holy cow? Swiss cheese, Swiss cheese. Tough crowd. Huh. <laughs> you got there. All right. <laughs> Any other things holy in our society? Holy Bible. Holy Spirit. Now, the thing I explained to the children a little bit ago is that when we talk about holy, we're not saying that something is in itself divine. To call it holy doesn't mean that it is a god. But we have things, so what holy literally means is to be set aside. And I use this example several times, so it's gonna be familiar to you, but it's something that I came up with on my own and I feel kind of proud in a Mennonite sort of way. <laughs> you remember my example of what it means to be holy. You go into a Mexican restaurant and you order guacamole on the side. It is separate from the rest of your food. It is holy guacamole. 
So to be holy means to be separated from the rest. So we have things like the Holy Bible. I have one right here. And the Holy Spirit. Let's use these two examples. If we turn to the original language, which I know you love to do, the word for Bible is biblion. And the word for spirit is pneuma. Should we do that together? Let's do it. All right. The word for Bible is biblion. And the word for pneuma is, or sorry, the word for spirit is pneuma. Now the thing is, these are actually really generic terms. The word biblion in Greek means a book, any book. You walk into a library, pull any book off the shelf. In Greek, it would be a biblion. Pneuma can refer to not only the spirit, the Holy Spirit, it can refer to any spirit. It also can refer to the wind. Like we had a lot of pneuma last couple of weeks. It can also mean breath. Like look at your neighbor, smell their breath. You can smell the pneuma on it. <laughs> so what separates this book from other books? What celebrates the Holy Spirit from other spirits? Well, they add the word hagias at the beginning. Now we can say hagias, everybody. Hagias. So the Bible is not just any book. It is the Bible, the book that is set aside from all other books. The Holy Spirit is not just some wind, breath, or spirit. It is the very Spirit of God that is separated from all other winds, breaths, or spirits out there. That is the very meaning of holy, separate from all the others. So a few years ago, I was speaking with a woman who's probably a generation or so older than I am. And she was talking about the story when her kids were growing up. Um, they were probably young, you know, not yet in school, maybe preschoolers. And she's driving around with them in the backseat of the car. She had two boys at the time. Two boys in the backseat of the car, and boys were being boys. They're being silly. Boys are silly. Um, some of them never grow out of that. So they're riding in the back of the car, and they hear something on the radio. It's probably they're listening to, to baseball, and Harry Carey comes on, and you holy cow, as he watches the, the ball fly over the, the, the fence. Um, and the boys pick up on this term, holy cow. And they just start playing with it. They say, holy cow, and they see a horse, holy horse. Um, they're looking at themselves, they're like, holy shoe, <laughs> holy microphone, because they had a microphone in their car. You know, holy hands, holy fingers, holy toes, holy nose. The boys are just having fun being silly as they drive along. Well, at some point, one of the sons just kind of paused and got real reveren reverential. And he kind of quieted his other brother down. He just, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Only God is holy. And the mom spoke of that as a very holy time. The boys came to that realization on their own. Because we find in places like Revelation 15, 4, who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. But then we come to passages like Exodus chapter 3. And in Exodus chapter 3, we find the story of Moses. He's out watching his father-in-law's sheep. And as he's out there tending to the sheep in the wilderness, out there in, in kind of the, the dry semi-arid land that surrounds that area, um, he sees a bush that's burning. And this bush is on fire, but it's not consumed by the fire. And he's like, ah, got to go check that out, because <laughs> that's what we do. Um, so he goes to look at this bush that's on fire. He wants to investigate what's going on here. And as he's approaching the bush, he hears somebody call out his name, Moses, Moses, because in my mind, God sounds like James Earl Jones. And he approaches this bush that sounds like James Earl Jones, and this bush speaks to him and says, Do not come any closer. Take your sandals off, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. So which is it, folks? Is God alone holy, or can the ground be holy? Because the ground seems like the very opposite thing of God to me. Like here we have the creator of heaven and earth, and we have dirt. We have the all-powerful Lord Almighty who created us and everything that we see and touch and hear and smell, and soil. So which is it? Is God alone holy, or can even the very ground upon which we stand be holy? 
And I want to say it is yes, both. But the reason that the ground was holy isn't because dirt in and of itself is holy. It was holy because of God's presence there. It was holy because God was reflected in that dirt. God was present there. God could be experienced there. God could be known through that. So when I think of these different words that we use in the church or outside of the church, these four words that I've been throwing around, the words holy and sacred and secular and profane, I like to think of them on a continuum. I tend to think of holy being extremely on one side. This is a reference to the creator of the heavens and earth. God alone is holy. Anything else that can be said to be holy is simply because of God's presence reflected within it. We continue to move to the other side. We find things that are sacred, things that give us memories or thoughts about God. We come to the far other end and things are profane. And I'm using our English translation of profane now, like profanity. These are the opposite things of that which is holy. But then right down the middle, I think we have this word secular. And too often in the church, we've used that word to think of things as being outside of the church. Being, things being bad, things being anti-holy or against the church. And in my mind, the word secular is not the opposite of holy, it's a very neutral word. Let me give you a few examples. For instance, you may go, in today's Mother's Day, mothers like mugs, you may go into, I don't, I got my wife a mug, she's not even my mother. <clears throat> anyway, <laughs> mothers like mugs, you can go into any store today if you haven't already purchased something for your mother and buy a mug with a Bible verse on it. Um, this one just happens to have Psalm 20, verse 4 on it. Um, you can find all sorts of Bible verses on mugs. I actually was looking for images of Bible verses on mugs, and one of them simply said, your verse here. <laughs> Whatever verse you want to put in there, um, knock yourself out. This is a, a Christian mug, right? It's a, a holy mug. You could say that's a holy mug. That is a, a very Christian mug. But the one that I have over here that I drink out of on Sunday mornings, this does not have any Bible verses on it. What does that say? Can you read, Marlene? Ohio. Lois? It says Ohio. Yeah. God's country right there. This is a very secular mug. <laughs> have you even been to Ohio? Then don't. <laughs> uh, this, is <laughs> this just has images of it, like a cow and carnation, um, a deer, Wright Brothers, born and raised in Ohio, um, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and a picture of the Amish here. Uh, Francis Weaver found this in a, in like a thrift store and, and gave it to me as a gift. You would not call this a holy mug, would you? It's not a sacred mug. It's rather secular. Does that make it a bad mug? No, no, it's just, it's just a mug. It's rather neutral. It's going to become a holy mug here in another like, half an hour or so because I'm going to baptize it, but other than that, I mean, wash it. That was funny. Come on. <laughs> the point I'm making is just because something isn't holy or Christian doesn't make it a bad thing. So we have this continuum, this, this holy, this sacred, this, this secular, this profane. And I want to apply that to some of the things that we see in the world around us. Things like music and art. We've all heard about secular music and secular art, and it's usually used in a very negative way, as if secular music is necessarily bad. Of course, we have holy music, we have sacred music in the church, but secular music, oh, that's for outside of the church. We have holy, sac sacred art in the church, um, stained glass windows in the church, beautiful things like that, and there's art that is very secular in its nature. But I don't think that means it's bad. And in fact, I want to say even what we call secular music and secular art can, in fact, be holy. Think about it like this. How many of us have ever heard John Denver, Denver sing about West Virginia? Oh, yes. You want to sing it with me? We'll save that for another time. I mean, listen to John Denver sing this very secular song about the beauty of God's creation and I feel moved in some way or another. Sometimes you want to feel moved away from the speaker if you're not into that thing. But still, you get the point. 
even something like art that seems very secular to you, a, a landscape or a picture of a bowl of fruit or an image of a person. It might be very secular in nature, but because of the beauty of that, you're moved toward God. I'm trying to show, again, this division between the sacred and the secular isn't as clear as we might want it to be. Now, many of us would agree that if you go out into nature, you will sometimes feel God's presence there. This is probably why many of us live where we do. You go out to the mountains and you see the beauty of God's creation. Or, or you know, we were a month ago in Arizona with my in-laws. We stood on the edge of the Grand Canyon and looked out on the beauty of God's creation. And you can't help but feel God's presence. In the scripture that Tate read for us, that entire chapter, I'm going to give you a few verses from that again. Look at what the psalmist says here. The psalmist says, Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures in all ocean depths lightning and hail, snow and clouds, stormy winds that do his bidding, you mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, small creatures and flying birds, kings of the earth and all nations, you princes and all rulers on earth, young men and women, old men and children. Is there anybody we didn't touch there? <laughs> we start at the depths of the sea, the deepest that you can go. You creatures in the depths of the sea, praise God. We go up to the skies, to the clouds, to the hail. And I don't usually think of hail as proclaiming God's glory, but here the psalmist is saying, praise God. You go down to the mountains and the trees. These, you're going from the lowest to the low to the highest to the high. Everything in between the trees, the animals, the people, the kings of the earth, the lowly children of the earth, all praising God. But the thing that I think of when I see this is I've never heard a fish sing a praise to God. I've never heard the mountains praise the Lord. But yet I know that there's something about them, the way that they were created, that they reflect the beauty of our Creator. These are items that were made by our God, and we see the perfect beauty of God in God's creation. So I'm going to take it one step further. I want to look at God's creation in humans. God created human beings in the image of God. Male and female in God's, God's image, he created them. You've heard that before? We were created in the image of God. The person sitting next to you was created in the image of God. No matter how weird they may look today, they're created in the image of God. And as people created in the image of God, we are created to be creators. We are created to make things. Sometimes that's for our job. Sometimes that's for fun for a hobby. People like to knit and create things. People like to weld and create things. People are woodworkers creating things. People are artists and musicians creating things. And I want to say anything that we create has the potential to reflect the image of God. We are one extra step removed from something like nature, but because we are created in the, in the image of God, the things that we create are second order creations in the image of God. The things around us have the potential to reflect God's creativity, God's beauty, and God's love. Music, art, woodworking, knitting, auto mechanics, construction, fashion design, the list goes on and on. These are not secular. They sure aren't profane. I want to say that these things are not holy in the same way that God is holy, but they are holy because they point us back to the Creator. So I come back to this person right here, this woman about to toss her infant into the water. The idea of Mother's Day. Is Mother's Day a holy day? Well, it's not defined in the Bible. We're not told we have to keep this holiday Remember the Mother's Day to keep it holy. No, nothing like that. But yet, as much as mothers reflect the image of God, this is a holy calling. Like God, mothers are the giver of life. Like God, mothers are called to be compassionate, caring, nurturing, feeding, giving healing to the babies, the kids, the, the even, I don't know, how old are you kids? Or you still go to your mom, like, I've got an ouchie, right? Heal, healers. 
Mothers reflect God's image, and in that we can see the image of God. So whether you work as a teacher, a professor, a lawyer, a doctor, whatever you might be, an auto mechanic, a farmer, your job is not secular, and it sure isn't profane. You don't check your Christian identity when you walk in the door. I hope you don't punch in and say, I'm no longer a Christian. You continue to reflect the image of God. Mothers do as well. And I, for one, am thankful for my mother. Let's pray. Loving God, we thank you today for the gifts of the mothers in our life. 